and through Facebook. I hope you folks are all, all holding up out there. We've got an amazing show lined up for you today, but before we have our guests come on, I thought it would be fun. I know that, you know, we get your live streaming here and I know you start throwing in some um, questions and answers that we've been bringing through on the show. One of the things I've been thinking about since I've been also sequestered in my home is what things have I learned in three weeks of being stuck in my home that I never really thought about before? So the first thing I learned is I made my very first apple pie from scratch with my daughter. And so I, uh, that was kind of a learning curve for me, especially when it came to the crust, we ended up cheating a little and buying a crust that was made, but it, the pie actually came out. I was pretty proud. So that's one thing. Um, the second thing is, you know, as you're, you're going about your day and I, I know you folks are all busy as am I, it made me realize how little time I really spend in the moment. So that was another thing. I'm really learning to slow it down, just really appreciate moment by moment things that are coming through in my day. And then the third thing is, is wow, you know, the things that I have at home, um, my art, the things that I've surrounded myself with being stuck in my home, I've really gotten a much greater appreciation for every little item of collectibles and artwork. And just, I think the environment that we live in is so crucial to our joy, especially when you can't go anywhere. So um, I was gonna open it up here and see if anybody had anything to say about that. And it looks like I've just got Cynthia on the line, but, um, I just think it's a good thing for us to contemplate. So while we're waiting for people to stream through and kind of share what it is that they've been doing, I wanted to let you know that here at Exclusive Collections, we are planning for our next show. So we're looking at probably around July, having a big shindig if everything you know continues to go in the right direction. I know here in California, we've been fortunate we've kind of flattened the curve out a little bit. So, you know, we're, we're hoping that continues in the right direction, but if all goes well, we're looking at a big July shindig here for our 25 years as, um, you know, artists and uh, art dealers here in San Diego. So uh, keep a lookout. You'll be getting email blasts from us. Uh, that's a very exciting thing. And we'll ha probably have a group show. So we'll have many of the artists that you love, just kind of like a homecoming with all you folks out there. So it should be a really great time. Um, it looks like I've got one artist on. I know that we've had a little bit of a, a difficulty with our streaming today because there's so many people online. Um, but I wanted to let you know that we have an amazing lineup. Um, the person that I'm going to bring on first has been a longtime friend of mine. I've worked with him on a few different projects. His name is Aaron Meyer. He's a uh, concert violinist, and he is known as a concert rock violinist because he brings in a really interesting uh, genre into his uh, music. This guy started at five years old started playing the violin and at 11 he had his first solo presence with the uh, Philadelphia Orchestra so that's a pretty big deal and then from there he's just really one of those folks kind of like the artists that you meet on the show it's just innate it's just within their soul to create and he's played with a lot of you know top name bands out there and I could you know give you a whole laundry list of these folks, but I think, let me see if I can bring him on the show and um, let's see if we can get him to come in to the, to the show here. All right, there you are. Hi, Aaron, how are you? I'm good, how are you, Luzanne? Good, can you hear us okay? Mm -hmm. I sure can. Great, well, thanks so much for coming on the show and blessing us with your talent. Pleasure. Um, so t before you get started, why don't you share a little bit with the folks what it's been like to uh, be stuck in Portland, Oregon, in your home? Uh, it's it's uh, I I work at home a lot, so I, I'm a little bit used to to being at home a lot. But of course, this is far more extreme than than anything. Um, my wife Renee and I are are she's now working from home too, so she runs her own business, and uh, we're we're just. You know, trying to make the best of it. We're trying to be productive. 
um, you know, do as, do as much as we can to help out. I've been doing um, Saturday night um, live Facebook concerts for whoever wants to tune in. Um, that's, right. been, that's been, you know, uh, an interesting project. And um, I've received a lot of great comments from that, from folks on, on those concerts. So that's been, you know, inspiring and, and knowing that it might help. So we like doing that, and um, I'm teaching a lot on um, either Skype or Zoom or any kind of video conferences, but I teach, I've been teaching by video conference for like seven years now, so I'm used to doing a lot of this. Um, I never thought that would come in so handy. <laughs> that is so great. So you, you kind of were ahead of uh, the rest of us who are just getting the hang of this. Well, I started teaching people that didn't, you know, kids that didn't live in in Oregon. So I, you know, I had a student um, in uh, Lake Tahoe area, and it nice. was a, a, a daughter of a friend. And I started teaching her, and she she did fine with the video conference, and um, she enjoyed taking lessons with me. And I like teaching her, so you know, we kind of got used to doing it that way. And then, of course, you know, other people and. Now I've got a really fun project that I'm super excited about. I travel to Southeast Asia every year and I started a violin school in Myanmar, which is a country to the west of Thailand, um, while I was there. And then, then I started teaching the kids before any of this, you know, before any of this lockdown, we would even know that would happen. But I already started teaching these kids 8,000 miles away, the violin. Wow. So I'm still teaching them. Um, so, you know, I teach people that are on the other side of the world. Um, That's amazing. Well, we're all going to have to uh, get on board with what you've already known. I'll probably be reaching out to you and say, how does this work? But, I, I think um, you're doing a good job. <laughs> I've, I've, I've put a couple people out of the show. Uh, I'm not on purpose, but, you know, I think I pushed the wrong button. But I was going to ask you, you know, your passion for teaching kids, that is really I mean, what a what a gift you are to be able to give back to these young people. And, you know, what was it like? I'm, I'm, I know you want to play for us and we want to hear it, but I'm just curious, you know, you started at a pretty young age at five years old. Um, what was it like to start that young and then have that such an incredible amount of success by the time you were not even a teenager? Well, I grew up in, in a home where uh, my, my violin teacher was my father. Oh, <laughs> so my dad taught um, classical violin for a living seven days a week in our home. So I was immersed in it and surrounded by it. And, you know, when I was four or five years old, you know, the kids would just come in for their lesson. They, you know, all afternoon long, They'd one go in, one, one go out. And I just sort of was, in my world, everyone played the violin. So I just assumed that's what, you know, young people do. And of course, when I was ready to play, I wanted to do it. And, um, uh, I, I loved music, and I guess the real kicker was is my father had a, a student. She was 11, and I was 5, and she had won a competition, and her prize was she got to solo with the Philadelphia Orchestra. So I got to go to this concert, and, you know, I'm 5, and here we are in, you know, a concert hall that seats, you know, 3,000 people, and then there's 100 and 100 plus you know, musicians, world class musicians playing in the Philadelphia Orchestra, a great orchestra. And this little girl played and I sort of freaked out. I said, Dad, I want to do that. And he said, OK. And then after the concert, we went back to my our home and my father had thrown a party for the girl that had won this competition and sold mm -hmm. with the Philadelphia Orchestra. And at the party, out came a cake about this bit. Oh, wait keeps getting bigger this big <laughs> in the shape of a violin and i turned to my dad and i said dad forget the concert i want that cake <laughs> That's and dad said well son here's how it works you will win that competition and when you do i'll buy you the violin cake so by when i was five years old i knew exactly what i wanted in life and that was the violin cake and to make the story a little shorter um i i did audition once i lost and then i went back when i was 10 I won when I was uh, 10, and then I sold when I was 11. That's so great. What a great story. And that's quite a bit of focus there for a young person. I love that. That's <laughs> wonderful. Well, let's, you know, let's welcome Aaron Meyer. I know we're virtual here, and um, but I'll be the audience, and I'll <laughs> welcome you to the stage, and I'll minimize myself here. 
Okay, well, this first piece of music is a, a beautiful piece of classical music. This is Meditation from Thais by Jules Messonnet. This was written in the 1890s uh, in France. Mm. Love that. 
And then, of course, I had to fast forward oh, to a little bit of Led Zeppelin. Of to, course. To bring Love me some Zeppelin. That's a beautiful, <laughs> unbelievable. Uh, can we squeeze? Like can we squeeze one more out of you? Of course. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> I think we I see the feed coming through. Everybody's mesmerized. Talk about being in the moment. You know, this is like exactly what we need for our soul right now. Oh, uh, well, I could say that um, Renee and I miss miss doing projects with you. We've had so many fun times doing art shows with you in San Diego, Portland, uh, Las Vegas and mm -hmm. Atlanta, all the different fun places that we did. We, we've done those shows together and, and I hope that um, we can get back to collaborating again because because that's been a really fun thing that's been a part of our lives. Maybe uh, in July, we're going to look at, you know, a big uh, a big shindig here in San Diego, bringing in all of our artists, doing a group show and that would be so you fun. Know, celebrating the overcoming of this yes. whole thing with art and music and great food and great wine. So definitely, I'm gonna minimize myself here. Okay. Whoops, wrong way, see? Okay, <laughs> there we go. So this next one, you'll recognize uh, the main melody as it comes from the movie score from Lawrence of Arabia. And this was written by Maurice Charest, an incredible uh, film score composer, just amazing. And uh, he wrote this music and when I saw this movie, um, about 30 years ago or, or so, I, I just fell in love with the music and went crazy and, and knew that one day I would record it. So we did that, and this is our arrangement. And you'll notice in the middle of the song, there's sort of a, a, a dramatic you know, change in the, in the music and the style, it changes tempo, the, whole, the vibe changes. And then that becomes um, some of my original ideas that I collaborated with members of my band. So we sort of start with a traditional piece of, of someone else's music and then sneak in our own and, and then come back. So anyway, here's uh, Lawrence of Arabia. Mm -hmm. Thank 
Are you just blown away? <laughs> I'm I'm completely breathless would be a good word. Amazing. Thanks. <laughs> so amazing. Every time you play, I have just been completely, there are no words really to describe what you bring through, even through the screen. It's thank you so much. So You're beautiful. Yeah. Just so beautiful. If I can help another time, just let me know. Any uh, last words that you'd like to share with the viewers of encouragement during this time? Uh, I think I think it's a, a great opportunity to just just be really, really, you know, as productive as we can. You know, you know, what spend time with family. I mean, what's more important than that? Um, you know, do things that are really meaningful. You know, mm -hmm. um, you know, use the time well. When do we get to have this much? You know free time so that's what i'm trying to do i'm trying to be productive and do good things and keeps the mind clear and and then you know we'll get back on track i love it thank you so much and You're folks welcome. go to the website aaronmeyer.com i put it here on the screen also you're doing on your facebook page on saturday you're doing concerts yeah i, I think i'm going to take this saturday off and i'll have it posted um, but um, I will certainly back, be back the following Saturday and the, the following Saturday after, after that. We've been doing live concerts from our home, um, and and it's it's just been a lot of a lot of fun during this you know unusual time. And um, uh, it's usually eight o'clock on Saturday night specific time. I think we're going to skip this this weekend just because there's a lot of holidays and things going on. And we'll right. resume um, you know the following Saturdays, but every Saturday eight o'clock Pacific time. Okay, it's perfect. That's date night there. You know, where yeah. else are you going to go? You've got Eric <laughs> Meyer streaming yeah. live. Get your Pinot Noir. You're ready to roll. You can get that Oregon Pinot shipped down, I think, even still. Yeah, absolutely. So, they're, perfect. They're do that, and they're rock and rolling with all that. So, All right. Give my love to Renee. Thank you so much again. Blessings yes. to you. And I'll be Thank looking you. forward to seeing you guys again soon. Can't wait. Take okay. care. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Well, folks, was that absolutely on a Wednesday? I mean, who gets to have a live concert from a world-class concert violinist coming streaming live into your computer screen or your phone? I mean, what a what a blessing. So, you know, on the on the good side, that's what, you know, this whole time period, I think we're going to reflect back and we're going to see that. There were some amazing things that we got to experience that we wouldn't have been able to experience if we didn't have this pause. And so we all got a little bit of a time out, but you know what? It's turning into being such a great blessing. And this next person I have um, that's coming on to the show, wow, she is, she's a powerhouse. I had an opportunity, I went out to do, I'm working on a film documentary series called Art of the City. And we, um, me and my uh, film crew, we went into New Orleans and we had heard about her through a good friend of mine. And we had actually brought her work into the gallery. 
but I got an opportunity to go out to her beautiful home where she has the most incredible uh, art studio. I mean, this art studio is unbelievable. She, she designed and had it built incredible, but I call her, I coined her my gypsy princess because she is a gal that uh, grew up around the arts, kind of like I did as a kid and her, both of her parents met at art school. And then, you know, probably as good parents, they said, whatever you want to do is great. Just don't go into art. Well, what did she do? She ran off and she joined the, the uh, circus. She went into a rock and roll band for 20 years and she rocked it. I saw some of her old videos and wow, she is truly a powerhouse. And then she went back to what her real roots were, which was art. And um, she's an incredible gal. I've got some of her works behind me here. This is uh, Molly McGuire, but she goes by on her, on her art title is Magwire, which I love. And so I'm going to see if I can get her up here on the show now. Okay, and here she is. Hi, everything. How are you? Oh, I'm good. How are you? Doing great. I know that uh, you know you. This has probably not been as tough as some of us urban dwellers, which are running around all the time because you live a little bit outside of New Orleans in the country in this incredible place. So, what has it been like though, not having access to? Because I know you go into the city on occasion and take care of business and do your thing. Yeah, uh, I mean, I've just been hunkering down. I, I, I would normally, under normal circumstances, go into New Orleans at least once a week to stock galleries and things like that. And, um, well, just uh, <laughs> that's not happening. That's really the only thing that is, that's changed about my life, as, as for now, anyway. So, um, but yeah, fortunately, I our house is in the middle of the woods and we're surrounded by a whole bunch of forest so day to day right now it just it looks normal to us uh, from right from our perspective until we turn on the news and then see what yeah what that I'm, I'm limiting myself you know i have i be like okay check it out in the morning check it out at night and that's it it's a little yeah. bit you know too much and information yeah we have a schedule like 15 minutes at four o'clock and that's all we get just just because it's 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 overwhelming you could just spend all day it's like a, it's just such a rabbit hole right now so right well um a lot of the folks have not seen your artwork and you know when we brought it in you know we 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 weren't really able to do a show and then this thing hit so i think this is a perfect time to introduce your artwork to the viewers out there and um kind of i brought a few pieces i thought this piece i don't know if you guys can see it i'm going to actually take it off the easel here i thought this was such a great piece to to start with because what a fabulous message for all of us, right? He's the day. <laughs> Maybe share a little bit about um, your style, you know, what you're inspired by. And, you know, I know that they are definitely, you know, inspired by the circus, but I want them to hear your take on what you're doing here. Okay. So I grew up um, in several small towns in near Toronto, in Ontario, Canada. And, uh, one of these places uh, had a had a carnival that would set up um, behind my house every summer for about a week. And it was, I would go when they were setting up, when they were breaking down. Uh, I got to know everybody. They showed me how to, you know, they let me ride the rides for free. They let me, you know, win at the games and that sort of thing. And it was the first time I ever felt like I fit in anywhere with the carnies. So... Um, carnival art is just sort of really close to my heart. It's sort of, it's like what's indigenously, uh, the indigenous style of, of carnival art just comes really naturally to me. So, um, uh, and then flashed to about 20 years later after I had, um, you know, had a career in music and this sort of thing, I was getting back to painting. I uh, was doing a lot of movie set work out in Hollywood, and I just started collecting all of the salvaged uh, movie set materials, like drop cloth okay. and house paint and that sort of thing. I started just tinting the colors and painting on the drop cloth, and it, you know, immediately turned into circus banners, just because it, it just how cool! Uh, 
Um, so it was all salvage materials. It still is. Um, you know, I actually tried doing non-salvage materials for a minute there, and it was just, what am I doing? <laughs> this is actually a better process. So I invented the entire process of um, painting on this used canvas drop cloth and um, right. tinting all of my own paint and stuff like that. So it's- But you, I think you had mentioned to me that before you went into music, when you wanted to go into art, you took this pretty rigorous training of doing uh, science, yeah. right? The old school way. Exactly. Well, my mom wouldn't let me go to art school. So she said if I wanted to go into the arts at all, it had to be something graphic, graphic uh, arts oriented. So she put me in a very inexpensive sign painting course, which I'm really glad I took it now because now you, you know, it's yeah, unreal. You can't take that course now if you wanted to. So, um, yeah, I'm a classically trained sign painter. Uh, so my lettering, my typography is, uh, um, you know, I, that's the only formal training I've ever had. So when but, you do this, <clears throat> for instance, this incredible piece right here, this Ouija board piece, do you do everything? It's all hand. How do you I mean, get it so perfect? It's it's just steady. It's hand lettering. It's It's just, you know, when I went to school for this, we were literally, it was the most uncreative course I've ever taken in my, in my life. I hated it. But so what you're doing is basically painting Helvetica for two years until you get it right and you can just do it in your sleep. So if you can paint Helvetica, you can paint anything. Helvetica is the most unforgiving um, uh, font there is. So. Okay. So for those of you who are, who, you know, we're dating ourselves a little bit, but before computers and before, when you went to get a sign made, it was somebody with this type of a skill set that went to school and did it all by hand, which is exactly. it's not, it's a lost art now. Nobody does this anymore. But right. Sure. And I graduated in, I think it was 91, which was the year that Vinyl Signs had come out. So it was the absolutely most absolute career for path I could have taken at the time <laughs> and which is why I ran away with a rock band because it was like there was no money in it at the time but now yeah. it's there's like a renaissance happening so it's now it's now nobody knows how to do it and, and everybody wants it so well that's one of the things that I think makes your work really unique so share with us you know I don't know if you have the ability to go around your studio but share with us what you've been working on I know you did that one amazing piece and I don't know if that um that poster that you did, if it oh, if that celebrates, I, yeah, I yeah. have posters of it, but okay. the original piece is, has gone back to its, uh, its okay. Owner, so it's not here in the studio right now. Uh, right now, I'm working on. This is <laughs> this is actually I'm really fortunate right now because people are still wanting circus banners. Go ahead, go figure. Um, I know it's not an essential business, but I'm still in business, so fortunately for me. Um, this is the biggest circus banner I've ever made. It's eight feet wide by five feet tall. As you can see, it doesn't even fit. Like I have it, I'm trying to see how it's draped over the side of my <laughs> easel wow. right now. It doesn't even fit. But it's um, one of my devil girls, and she's riding a vintage John Deere tractor. And she's in the middle of a Tabasco pepper field, and there's little devils harvesting the Tabasco peppers. That is so cool. Any way we can get a little closer to see it? Yeah, I think so. Okay. It's a work in progress. I don't really okay, show I'm going to minimize myself, too, so we can get you in the screen more there. I'm going to okay. unplug myself from this, I think. Okay. That should, that should be okay, right? I'm yeah. Just, my audio. Can you still hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Okay. All right. Devil girl. Oh, yeah. oh, how cool is that? So the uh, so, sorry about my camera angle here, but um, so yeah, it's the person who's commissioning this um has a apartment in a vintage uh, warehouse building downtown New Orleans that used to be a John Deere tractor showroom. So that's why, that's why this is all happening. So it's that's actually funny. gonna, isn't that funny? Yeah, but Devil Girl, that's part of your regular series, right? Because I think we do, we had one of those or we have one in a poster form. Yes, I've done, 
she's one of she's my most repeated theme, um, Devil Girl of the Bayou. And uh, so far I've done 19 of them. This will be 20, but this won't really count as Devil Girl number 20 because it's gonna be actually called Raising Hell Down on the River. So that's what this piece is gonna be called. And but, what um, are your what are the most popular themes that people ask you for? Devil Girl's number one. Um, Marie Laveau is another uh, pretty well desired one. I have a picture of Marie Laveau. Okay. Over here. It's my Marie. Uh, that was the famous uh, voodoo madam, right? Exactly. Okay. That's New Orleans' famous voodoo queen. Um, queen. Exactly. I'm working on Feline Fortuna. That's, uh, sorry. It's kind of hard to get a good angle with my laptop. No, we got it. We can see it. Okay. That's a work in progress. And I'm just, you know, all of my original artworks right now, I'm just, it's kind of nice because I'm spending some really uh, quality time with this stuff and putting kind of a surplus of detail into these pieces just because I have so much, you know, there's so much time on my hands. Normally this time of year, I'm slam getting ready for Jazz Fest. That's what I was gonna ask you about because ja didn't Jazz Fest get canceled then? It's been canceled. Um, they say they're gonna postpone it, but they haven't proposed dates yet. Um, they, did, they did cancel a French Quarter Festival as well, which I, I actually did the um, the poster art for French Quarter Fest, and that's downstairs. I'll take you downstairs to look at that. Yeah, I'd love to see that. Yeah, this I is know. really, it's really interesting because I know a lot of the art fairs got canceled. Of course, you know, for artists that are from and living in New Orleans, Jazz Fest really represents the bulk of your sales for the year to continue to, you know, do the, the smaller galleries and the things that you're doing. Isn't that correct? Oh yeah. It's, I mean, it's how most people that vend at jazz fest, as far as the artists go, that's their income for the year. Right. And including mine. So we're a little bit up, up the Creek at the moment. And so this is a French quarter festival. Okay. Let me minimize myself here again. Oh, that's great. I love that. Sorry, I'm going to. That's my French Quarter Festival artwork. It's uh, four feet wide by five feet tall. It's entitled Alligator, Dressed Alligator Po' Boy. And um, as you can see, April 16th to 19th, well, that's not happening. <laughs> yeah. is just, is I'm not laughing because of that. I'm just thinking if anybody's had a po' boy, that is just so funny to have her dressed in lettuce like that. Right. And there's a there's just a saying here called dressed. Like if you order your po' boy dressed, it means with everything on it. So okay. That's what that's what she represents. That's my dress yeah. girl. Okay. That's like uh, getting the um, in and out animal style if you're from California. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I used to get that. I love the animal style. That was my yeah, yeah, yeah. Same, same idea. It's kind of just that your local lingo. Yeah. A little, a little um, insider tip. So, of all the works that you've created, I know that you, you, I mean, you had a really big deal happen when you did all of the um, back. Was it the backdrops or the posters in the sets for the um, American Horror season five? Horror, right? so, yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, I did all the all the the circus banners for season four freak show. Oh, it was season four. Okay. So yeah. folks, if you want to go back, I know a lot of people are big fans of that. Go back and take a look at that. You're going to see Maguire's work right in there. And um, I know that really kind of solidified you with this whole style and, and elevated your art as the artist doing these uh, circus banners, which is really great. Yeah, I actually have a couple of those hanging in my bathroom. They weren't, they were just really small paintings that ended up getting photographed and then printed onto canvas and then stretched for the actual set. So if we go in here, we can see, I got to keep two pieces. Great. At Lizard Man and the Human Giant, which were pieces that um, 
just didn't get, they, those two characters didn't get cast. So the art director was just like, you can just keep it. So. That's wonderful. <laughs> well, something that you mentioned to me when, when I was in your studio and it kind of stuck with me and I thought it was such a pro profound thing to say when you were talking about as a child, going to the circus and or going you know, to the carnival and seeing these posters outside and how they were almost you know representing you're going to see this show when you get in and they were bigger than life and then when you got in eh, you know whatever it was it wasn't all that but the the actual banner itself brought you into this world that right. was magical and i thought gosh that's just such a cool way of looking at at art yeah i learned at a very young age that it was it was really just that moment where you're looking at the banners and your imagination is going wild and just that that's the pinnacle emotion that you know that i'm trying to create as an artist cuz um you know once you go inside the tent and pay your 25 cents or whatever sometimes Sometimes it's a little downhill from there. <laughs> so I try and I try and just keep that that pinnacle moment where your imagination's running wild with excitement. Yeah, I love that. That's beautiful. Um, well, I think that you know when I look at your work and we've got I wanted to show the folks this one too, because I thought this is such a fun piece. And let me bring my screen up here so that you guys can see it a little bit better here. Okay, there we go. Can you share a little bit about this one? I think this is so fun. Oh, the Biff Bop, the uh, the two headed clown. He's got uh, that's was just sort of something I I love to paint clowns. I just I don't know. I uh, that piece was um, sort of representational of a of a science experiment gone wrong, and. Uh, mm -hmm. It's just a fun little piece that I it's did. It's so fun. It's actually one of my favorite because I think those guys are so crazy looking. <laughs> it's just really fun. And I think that's the thing about your artwork is when I when I look at your artwork, it it really I transcend back to my childhood. And I think that's such an important thing as we, you know, as adults, we take everything so seriously. And right now, especially, we're very, very serious times here. But I think your work, it transcends the age that we think we are, and it brings us back into that little window of imagination, creativity, everything fun can happen, get a little wild, you know, enjoy, take it all in, you know, it's fleeting. And, I, and I, that's what I love about your work. It's magical in that way. Thank you. Yeah, it's, uh, I try and just capture the, the visceral, pleasure that I remember having when I was a kid looking at this kind of thing. So super important. Well, thank you so much for sharing your artwork with us. We're looking at a big July shindig, which obviously you're going to be invited to. So folks, she'll be able to meet this wonderful woman in person who is really, I think, bringing us something special. I've never seen another artist create, create artwork like you do. So, um, Keep doing that. Thank you so much. All right. Yeah. Well, be well. And we will probably, if we keep going, I'm going to bring you back on the show. But otherwise, we'll probably see you here in July. Oh, that'd be wonderful. I'll keep it open. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay. Rock on, girl. All right. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. All right. See take you care. Again soon. Okay. Bye. All right. Bye-bye. All right, folks. That was the show today, Art of the City TV. Keep in mind that we've um, launched a YouTube station um, and you can go and you can you know, share these with your friends so they're not live. A lot of people, they've got other things going on. I don't know what anyone would have going on right now, but if they can't tune in, they can always check it out a little bit later. It's saved there um, on YouTube. Same thing, Art of the City TV. So I really appreciate you folks tuning in. Please share this with your friends. We're also going to be launching the very first episode of our tour, starting with a series called Art of the City TV. It's a documentary. It starts here in San Diego where we have gone in and we filmed the stories. You know, rather than having a live format, it's a little bit more polished. 
uh, starting with an amazing artist who's from San Diego, James Hubble. So if you get a chance, go to YouTube. It will be live later today, Art of the City TV. You can click on the first episode. You'll also find all of these episodes that we've had just um, the live on the fly ones, which have been fun. But please do me a favor and share that with your friends. The more viewers, the better. We want to share the arts with folks, especially right now, because as you could feel that music soothing us in our soul, <clears throat> the visual arts do that also. So it's very important. So be blessed. Friday, don't miss us. 1 p.m. We'll be here with Lyman Whitaker, and he'll be sharing from his studio his beautiful copper sculptures. And we are also going to have a little bit of a wine tasting. So Karuth Sellers, who happens to be my neighbor over here in uh, Solana Beach, they're going to be bringing in wines and giving us a little class on how to choose wine, what to look for. So, you know, we're going to give you a pass. I know it's not five o'clock yet. Uh, it's one o'clock, but we're going to give you a pass to go ahead and open up a bottle of wine. I know I'm going to have one here. So we'll do a little virtual tasting. So have a blessed day. Thanks for tuning in to Art of the City TV live streaming. We'll see you on Friday.